Hey everybody, my name is Max Carter and you're watching the Max Carter Show. If it is your first time here, welcome. I'm excited for today's guest who's not only an accomplished actor, singer, and director, but also an incredibly passionate and inspiring individual. Telly Leung is joining us today. And Telly's career spans from portraying the Aladdin on Broadway in New York to uh, acting in Glee. And finally, he can call himself a Londoner, even for a little bit, as the cast of The Allegiance, a musical inspired by George Takei's life, premiered in the West and last month. I have been fortunate enough to attend the premiere and speak to both Telly and George. And let me tell you, you can't miss that duo. So if you haven't bought your tickets, make sure to go and see the show. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Telly. Telly, I'm grateful for your time today, and thank you very much for joining the Max Carter Show. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. First of all, welcome to London, and how is London treating you? Did you have a chance to explore it at all? Yeah, you know, I've I've often been to London before because I love it here as a tourist. I've been here, so I've done, you know, all of the touristy things of getting on the hop-on, hop-off bus and the Tower of London and Big Ben and you know, all of that. And, and Westminster Abbey, I've, I've done all the touristy things before. And my first time in London was, gosh, back in 2005, I was here on a vacation. And I've been coming here ever since, you know, it's a very short six hour flight from New York to London. So I'm often one of those people that will fly to London for a week, you know, for five days and see eight shows. Like that's usually what I do <laughs> is I pack in all the theater. Um, but this is my first time working here. So it's been um, a, definitely a, a wonderful experience to, to see what it's like to be a London-based actor and working on an actual show here, eight shows a week. Uh, do you have a favorite place here? My favorite place? That's a wonderful question. It changes all the time. It and at, at the moment, I'm going to say that whole area near Seven Dials is sort of my favorite because my, our theater is right near there. And it's a nice place for me to just like walk around and get lost a little um, walking through all those little streets and finding cafes and little shops and things. Um, so uh, that, that's that been my favorite place so far because it's, I, I always feel like I find something new when I'm walking those streets. Do you still feel like a tourist or are you more of a Londoner now? <laughs> no, I, don't, I definitely don't quite feel like a Londoner yet because I still need to uh, be glued to my Google Maps as I walk through the streets of London so I don't get lost. But um, I'm getting there. I mean, I've been living here for four years now, still Google Maps, Apple Maps every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> and talking about The Allegiance, this incredible musical, which has finally landed here in London after shows in San Diego, New York, Los Angeles. How did that decision co to come over here was made and what did it take? Well, I think much of the decision was from our star and the person who inspired the show, George Takei. He, uh, at 85 years old, he has never been on Broadway. So this, uh, he had never been uh, performing in London. And at 76 year old, when we did the show on Broadway, he made his Broadway debut. He had never done Broadway before. I mean, George has had an extensive career in television and doing theater and film, but he's, he's never done a Broadway show. So at 76, I remembered, you know, celebrating him on his Broadway debut. And now at 85, he says, listen, I, I love this show. The show is my passion project. It's my legacy project, but I've never done a show in London. Uh, I really want to take Allegiance to London. So we, so our producers figured out a way to do it. And when, when I heard that was happening, I said, oh, me neither. I've never done a show in London either. I want to come. So, um, so the both of us decided to bring the show here in a much more intimate uh, setting than we did in London, than, than in New York. For sure. The theater is much smaller. You have both sides. It feels much more intimate, much more. It feels like you're almost there. You're involved. You can see it's happening there. Yeah, I had friends who, come, who came to the show last night who said that the show feels in some ways voyeuristic and that, you know, the audience is so close to us. They're in the space with us. You know, the, the, uh, our Broadway show in 2015 at the Long Acre Theater was a traditional Broadway show in proscenium. You know, there's a stage, there are curtains, there are, there's automation, there's projections, that, you know, all of that that it very much feels like a Broadway show. You know, there's an orchestra pit, there's 16 musicians in the pit. Well, here we, we, we are doing the show in traverse, which means that there are audiences on two sides and the action is happening in the middle, almost like a almost like a runway at Fashion Week or something, right? Like it's there that there's people on two sides. So in many ways, it's that the audience is really observing what is happening and getting a peek into the, the relationships and these people's lives and and what they're going through in a very different way. And 
Sometimes the audience is even watching other audience members watch the show and are keenly aware of that experience as well. It, it's actually much more, um, it has a much more community feel to it. Like we're all going through this experience together. And I think that works well for the show. And I would imagine it's much harder for you to act there when you know there's 360. Yeah, you know, I've done shows in the round and I've done shows in three quarter. And yes, it is uh, oftentimes when you first start rehearsing those shows, and I found this this also to be the same for this process here in Allegiance and Traverse, is that you feel like, oh gosh, like which side of me should I be facing or which side should I be cheating out to or turning to so that more audience members can see me. And then eventually you realize, oh right, like somebody's always going to have the back of my head. Like somebody's always going to have, you know, but as long as I don't stay there too long and as long as I I keep myself, keep myself generous to all sides of the audience. I'm okay. And once you sort of accept that, that somebody's always going to have the back of your head, that not no two people in the theater are going to have the same view of your performance or of the story, then it's actually quite freeing because you say to yourself, well, I just have to be. And the people that are watching the show, it is just their job to observe me being. And I don't have to worry about who's getting my good side, who's getting the back of my head, who's getting my, who's getting, you know, the, the best angle of me, because somebody is definitely not going to get that at this moment. And then five, five seconds later, they will, somebody else will get a better, better angle of the story. Right. And I think that's what makes it perfect. Yeah. And you mentioned that this opportunity to be a part of the Allegiance is one of the proudest moments in your career as you got to create your character, Sammy, from the ground up. My question is, what did that, process look like and how did that role come about? Yeah, I think um, I think something that a lot of theater lovers don't know is that working on an original musical from page to stage, from the very first reading to to its, you know, Broadway premiere, first of all, for a show to even get that far is miraculous, right? Like all the stars have to align, all of the people have to be available for those particular projects. The project has to have the kind of momentum and the funding and the interest. The real estate has to be available for a Broadway show to premiere on Broadway. Same thing, same thing in London, you know? Um, so all of those stars have to align for that show to even happen. Um, and so for me to get to go, to get to create a role from a reading, every time I did a reading of the show, and my first reading of the show was back in 2010, I was like, well, that was nice. Who knows if there's gonna be another reading? You know, and every time there was another reading, it was a wonderful, pleasant surprise to get to revisit this role. For our writers and our creators, it was a wonderful opportunity for them to revisit the script, the score, the the moments in the show, the characters, the, the characteristics of the characters. You know, my, my character went from being uh, Sammy, who was 17 years old and had asthma and went to the internment camp and couldn't serve in the 442nd because of his asthma, to now being somebody who is a little older in his mid twenties that goes and fights in the 442nd, one of the most decorated uh, regiments in war in American war history, you know? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, it's changed that much, you know, Leia Salonga's character that she created from page to stage uh, used to be named Gloria. Now she's named Kay, you know, she used to be my Japanese tutor. Now she is my sister. Like those are the giant changes that have happened in the script. In the script, I used to have a mother and the brother character, those characters have been cut out of the script. So that means as characters come and go, and as as the creators start morphing the script, new songs get added, new scenes, new dance numbers. So, you know, there, I always say in the 13 years that Allegiance has been in existence, there are more songs in the trunk that have been cut than are actually in the show now. Um, and I was privy to all of it, right? I was privy to all of those changes through the last 13 years. And so, you know, every time, every time I did the show, I was always blown away by how diligently those creators, our original director, Staff at Arima, and our writers, Marc Asito, Lorenzo Tioni, Jay Quo, how tirelessly they worked at making it better and better and better. They, they held nothing precious. You know, there were certainly things about Allegiance that they loved, that they wanted to keep. They wanted to keep this incredible story that a lot of people didn't know, but the how they told it was something that they were always playing with. Um, they, they were not afraid to take that wonderful song that they wrote that they loved yesterday and completely cut it and throw it out because they know, knew something better was coming, or at least at the attempt of something better, right? And I think that that is really impressive as well for writers to, you know, it, we, we, have a, we have a terrible term in, our, in the theater that we say they, that you're willing to kill your own babies sometimes because you've made this beautiful thing, but in an effort to 
um, make something better and make the story clearer and more emotional and more impactful. So um, for me, it's it's a dream to take the show to London, you know, I, for, and, and, it's, and it's also a pinch me moment because, I, you know, one never knows. You're doing all of these readings of shows and you go, oh, we're, we're doing another reading. Oh, great. Now we're doing a workshop where we're on our feet and there's no scripts in our hands. Oh, and I guess now we're going out of town to try out the show. Well, who knows if Broadway is going to happen? And then Broadway happens. You go, this is a miracle that it happens. And it's a miracle if it happens for a day. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, so, and now to know that it's here in London, seven years later, you, if you had told me seven years ago that I'd be doing the show in London, I'd be like, get out of here. No way. You know, but here we are. I love to hear that. And did, did Sammy take anything from telly? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because I was in the, uh, I was in part, so much a part of the creation of this. I think so much of Sammy is written on sort of who I am, right? I mean, I, Sammy is an all American kid, a child of immigrants from Salinas, California. I am a child of Chinese immigrants from Hong Kong who lives in New York City. And I constantly feel like I am, I am straddling my the the duality of my identities you know when people ask me like what are you i always say chinese american and it's hyphenated i feel very equally two parts of that like i don't feel i feel very chinese and i feel very american and i think that is a unique i think that is a very american experience you know america is a country that was formed you know the america we know today besides our native americans of course population that had been there all along but the america that we know today is made up of people that have come from elsewhere, right? So everybody that's American is a hyphenated something, unless you're a Native American, right? So I, I, um, I think that I, I, I definitely relate to Sammy. And of course, those writers, you know, having me in the room for 13 years of working on this show, I think they were like, oh, let's write for Telly's sensibilities. Let's write for Telly's strengths. Let's write for Telly's voice. Let's write for Telly's um, humor, you know? Amazing. And you're incredibly bright on stage as well. And I love your personality. But to all the viewers watching this, what is Telly like off stage? Uh -huh. um, I don't know. There are there are a lot of similarities. I think that um, it's interesting. I, I think Sammy is probably a bit more, um, even more American and disconnected from his traditional Japanese roots than I am probably c connected to my very traditional Chinese roots. You know, I did grow up in an immigrant family. Um, I am bilingual, you know, Sammy in our story doesn't speak Japanese and is really super assimilated in all American. Whereas I really did feel like I led a double life growing up as a kid that as, um, as a Chinese American kid, you know, both my parents had blue collar jobs. So, you know, my mom worked as a seamstress. My dad worked in restaurants. It was long, long hours. My grandma basically raised me at home. Right. Um, and, uh, and she didn't speak any English. So at home, I only spoke Cantonese Chinese to her. And when I was in school, I sort of like, you know, did a costume change and I was that all American kid from Brooklyn, right? Only speaking English to my friends. And when I was home, I would be the good Chinese kid helping grandma cook dinner and learning how, learning her recipes and doing chores and only speaking in Chinese. And so it was a very, um, I sort of let, felt like I led a double life. Probably what, what probably helped me be an actor in the first place was, was sort of being able to like code switch and flip between the two personalities, you know? Um, and so I, I, I feel like for sure there's, there's, there's a lot, that's probably something that people might not know about me. Um, uh, and, uh, that, that, and that, I don't know, I love to eat. <laughs> that's the other thing. I don't know if that's true about Sammy, but you know, like I, I, one of the, one of my wonderful things that, that is, uh, I consider to be such a benefit of, of this profession, you know, being an actor and being a performing, being in show business, there's a lot that is scary about it. The instability of work, one global pandemic in your entire industry is on the brink of collapse, right? Um, and, and you never know where your next job or your next meal or your next rent check is coming from sometimes. But what I do love is the opportunity to travel on somebody else's dime and to be in places like London to actually feel what that's like to live in another country and make theater, to make theater with international artists. You know, I, there's such a strong community of Asian American performers. It's a very tight knit family. Allegiance helped foster that because Allegiance was an original musical that featured so many of us. Um, now we've extended that family over here to British Asian artists. And that's really great. This Allegiance family just keeps growing and growing. You know, there's a wonderful Allegiance family in Tokyo because the show was translated and done in Japan. 
And um, I got to know some of those actors uh, when I was working in Japan, not on Allegiance, but I was working on another show with the actor, actually, Naoto, that plays Sammy in Japan, singing in Japanese. We did a Jesus Christ Superstar together. And so um, that sort of international exchange of cultures and of uh, through the through theater, because we are all working on this show, because we are gigging together in a foreign country, like that's great. And oftentimes those cross cultural moments happen between food. <laughs> Any place you'd like to take allegiance next? Um, you know, it's interesting. I've had so I, I I don't know if I will take allegiance anywhere next, right? Like um, uh, again, I I really thought the end of my journey was going to be when the Broadway show closed. Uh, in, in 2016, in February of 2016. And I was like, you know what? I've worked on this show now for seven years and you know, I, 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 my, my, my mark is on it and I'm done. Um, and, and I really didn't think I was gonna put on Sammy shoes again. Um, but when George said, oh, let's go do it in London. I said, yes, I would love to do it with you as well. It's three months. I will absolutely put on the Sammy shoes again and, um, and do it again. I would love, actually I've started directing a lot more um, and uh, right after this, I actually go and direct a production of Rent at the University of California, Irvine. Um, Rent is also a show I know very well because I, I was in the final company on Broadway. Um, and it's also the show at 16 years old that made me want to do theater because I was a high schooler when Rent first came out. And it was the it's sort of the show of my generation, right? So um, I'm going to go direct that next. And I don't know, in 10 years from now, I would love to be able to direct a production of Allegiance, right? I hope that Allegiance, now that we've had a production you know, a, a, a record-breaking production in San Diego, which was the premiere, then Broadway. Then we did it in Hawaii. We did it in Los Angeles. We did, you know, it's been done in Boston, now London. I hope that the show has a life beyond this now, now that it's sort of reached Europe and that other people are interested in doing the show, whether it's with me or George or whoever, right? But that they're interested in telling this story. And one day I would love to be able to sit in a director's chair behind the table and reinterpret the story um, again. I love that you mentioned it because it was actually my next question. Uh, talking about directing shows such as Yellow Face and obviously Rent, given that experience, especially the one you had on, on stage, how is that job different and what do you like about it? Yeah, I, I you know, I um, a director has to have sort of an, a, a very bird's eye view of the whole thing, right? So as an actor, it is my job to focus on this the moment to moment of what I am doing with my fellow actors, right? It is also my job to be um, to honor the author's intention of what they want, so what the composer wants, what the book writer wants, what the uh, what the lyricists want, right? Um, and you are at the service of somebody else's vision for something. Good actors have an awareness of all the departments, right? Of like what the lighting is doing in this moment, what the scene scenic design is doing in this moment, what your costume is doing for you. Good actors sort of take all of that in and are able to use all of that as that to inform their performance, right? Um, but really, an actor's responsibility is the moment to moment on stage and doing that consistently, eight shows a week. A director actually has has to oversee all of those departments and to make sure that they all sort of line up or in, are in sync and are working together and click together. I also feel like the biggest responsibility of directing is just to create a safe space in a rehearsal room for the actors, create a safe space in design meetings to allow my artists that I've brought into the fold to do their best work. You know, it's it, in many ways, it's interesting. I, as an actor, it is my job to make strong choices and then have a director go, you know what, that I, I love that you made that choice. Try something else, or that's a great choice. Thank you for suggesting that. Like as the director, uh, oftentimes, yes, there's gonna be certain choices that I wanna make as a director, as far as my vision goes and the direction of how, some, how something goes. But I also, as a director, love saying, I don't know. I actually don't know until I bring you in the room and I bring designers in the room and other great artists in the room to create something that would not be created had I not brought these artists in this room to share the space together, to make something. You know, I think it's very important for directors to realize they are not a one man band. They don't have all the answers and to look to their team and trust their team, whether that's designers or actors or whoever to go, okay, this is a moment that stumps me, help me. Let's figure this out together. And it's just my job to really make sure that that space exists for that kind of creation to happen. I love to hear that. I think it also can be transferred to other jobs, other industries as well, about creating the safe space, about 
empowering other individuals because you would yourself would know not know all the answers. Yeah, you know it's interesting during the pandemic when there was no when there were no uh, theater jobs and performing jobs to be had. I did a little bit of executive coaching, which is actually you know coaching C suite CEOs and VPs at giant companies um, about about this very thing about a different way of being a leader. Now, I think for so long, corporate leaders, especially people who are in charge of hundreds of thousands of employees at a giant company, are expected to know the answer, are expected to know how to deliver profits that keep increasing and increasing and increasing. Guess what? Then a global pandemic hits, and what every leader has had to face is the unknown. Well, guess who deals with the unknown at all times? Actors, performers, people in show business. When the pandemic came around, yes, it was very hard for my industry. But also something that I knew my industry would weather because we, we weather it all the time. I, I often don't know where my next job is coming from. I often have to embrace that unknown because that unknown, although is scary, is also ripe with opportunity for something that you did to surprise you, right? And so, oftentimes, I had like I was brought in to do a little bit of executive coaching with these CEOs who are so used to ha- knowing the answer. This is how we do it. This is how we. Increase profits. This is what you know. If we do this in quarter three, quarter four will look like this. And guess what? We all were met with this huge moment of uncertainty. Then how do you deal with that uncertainty? Well, the only way you deal with uncertainty and to have the people that work for you trust you is to go. I don't know either, but I know that if we're together, we're going to figure it out. And I think that that is the that is why I'm still in the theater because to me, the theater is this microcosm of the world I want to see. You know, wow. if we could all do that, if we could all really be honest with ourselves and go, we don't know everything, but and that's okay that we don't know everything. But I do know that whatever the unknown is, that if we are all together, we can face it together, and we'll be all right as long as we're all doing it together. That is theater, really. If you think about it, right? Like, you know, you can, I can forget a line on stage if my scene partner is there to catch me. Brilliant, it'll be okay. You know what I mean? Like, if that audience is full of empathetic. People and even if you drop a lyric or crack on a note, they they'll realize you're human and they'll forgive you. You know what I mean? Like it's okay. Like it's gonna be all right. You know. And that, it, but believe it or not, that little that little microcosm, you know, is what I hope the world to be. Which is why I think I continue to do theater. Is it true that you teach classes as well? I do teach. Yeah, I try to teach as much as I can. I I taught. Especially during the pandemic, I taught full time at NYU a little bit. I taught a class called vocal performance. I guest teach and I guest direct at, at universities all the time, um, at the University of Michigan and my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon. And um, so I really do enjoy teaching. And you know, I was filming a show in South Africa for three and a half months uh, last summer into the fall, and I was teaching musical theater students in South Africa. And like, I, you know, and I loved it. Like, it's it's great. I really enjoy it. It keeps me honest as a as a performer and as a director to, um, to, to teach students, you know? And what about your mentors and people who influenced you, influenced you the most in your life? I'm sure there are many, but what, what are like first ones that come to mind? Yeah. I had um, a, a wonderful high school teacher. I went to a math and science high school. So it wasn't a performing arts school at all. And I really did theater for fun after school. And the, there was a gentleman there. His name is Vinnie Grosso. He's no longer there. He taught audiovisual and he taught mechanical drafting. You know, he taught CAD, you know, and digital drafting, right? Um, but he volunteered his time after school to direct the musicals. And Mr. Grosso taught me, I think, the most, probably the most valuable lesson ever in the theater, which I always impart to my students, which is that... You know, the theater, and it sort of goes back to what I said in my last answer, you know, it, it, everybody's job in the theater is important. So, yes, you as the star of the show with your name above the title in lights may feel like the most important person. But guess what? If there's nobody to turn on those theater lights, your light, your, your name doesn't go up there. If there's nobody to sell tickets, there's nobody coming to your show. If there's nobody to take the tickets at the box office, the audience can't get to their seats. If there's nobody to turn the lights on you on stage, you know, if there's no set, if there's no costume, you walk on stage naked, like every person's job, every person's job is important in the theater and should be valued and respected, you know? So the person whose name it is on the top of the marquee, who's the star of the show is no more or no less important than the janitor whose job it is to sweep the stage every night. Because if that person didn't do their job, 
you wouldn't have a clean stage to perform on as the performer, you know? And it's something that I've always sort of carried with me everywhere. So true. And I'm privileged to study at Goldsmiths University of London, which is a creative community. And on a daily basis, uh, I meet incredible people, study all sorts of things, including creative arts. Is there any advice you have for people who want to dedicate their life and pursue career in creative arts? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm sure for many people that are pursuing a career in the arts, me included, we've been told, well, how are you going to, how are you going to feed yourself doing this, being a creative, just get a job as a, as an accountant or get a job as, you know, in something that is stable. Right. Um, and I, and I, I, I don't know, especially during the pandemic when so many jobs were deemed, these are essential workers, right? Like, and of course they are essential. Our, our medical professionals, our doctors, our nurses, essential first responders, like all the people working grocery stores during a global pandemic, risking their health to make sure your groceries, the groceries were stocked. Like those are definitely essential people. But, but I think what ended up happening was creative people and artists started to feel not essential when Broadway is the first thing that gets shut down live, live performance venues. But, you know, I would also say that I, I would also challenge anybody who says those people are not essential. Well, during this pandemic, when we were all in our homes, did you watch a Netflix show? Like, did you read a book? Did you like watch a movie with your friends? Like, did you feel better after you did that? Did you learn something by doing that? And that's where the creative people come in. We are just as essential and healing to the world. So I would say as a creative, you know, there are going to be times where there are people that tell you, you are not valuable or you're not essential. And that's actually the complete opposite. And I would, I would implore all of you who feel that way about each other, or about yourselves, to remember that time in the pandemic when creativity and creative people helped you get through something really difficult and isolating and hard and made you feel not so alone, right? That being said, a career at being creative is a different thing than being a creative person. Anybody can be creative, right? So you can be somebody who has a job, like, and, and I'm going to say accountant, but even though accountants can also be very creative. So like, you know, but I'm saying like, there are some people who might go, I'm going to do this job. It doesn't mean anything to me, except it's, it's, it's at a job that puts money on the table. And then I can, I can be, paint on the weekends. I can do community theater. I can sing in church. And that's my little dose of creativity. For some people, that's okay. For people that want to make it a career, just know that it, you are constantly going to be balancing art, commerce, art, commerce. You're always going to be sort of doing this interesting dance of like, am I doing this for the love of the art and because it's going to make me a better artist? Or am I doing this because this is filling my bank account so that I can afford to do the things that might make me a better artist, but doesn't pay me very much money. And that this is what you're going to be doing constantly your entire career. And that it's sometimes it's okay to do the thing that is very creative, that makes you a better artist, that you can't put a price tag on, but that makes you no money in your bank account. And sometimes it's also okay to take that job that makes you a lot of money so that you can go away and write your play and not have to worry about paying your bills, right? Or go away and work on that sculpture and not worry about how you're gonna eat, right? Like both, both things exist when you're a creative artist and you have to, you're constantly gonna be balancing that. That never ends. Wow, what an incredible conversation. Thank you so much, Deli, for giving your time yeah. today. I'm excited Absolutely. to see where the road takes you, but know that I'm on my side rooting for you. Thank you. And um, good luck to all the students out there and keep being creative. We need you. That's right. Thank you. Thanks.